According to the U.S. Census Bureau, one in five Americans are disabled and one in ten have severe disabilities. What should the able-bodied most Americans know about the disabled? What would help us be better neighbors, friends, or colleagues? How might our lack of knowledge or sensitivity be hurtful? Welcome to Insights. I'm Dick Goldberg, and today, to help us better understand the world of the disabled is Shelley Petterman Schwartz. Shelley was a teacher to the hearing impaired for 13 years, but in 1981, she had to retire from that career due to her multiple sclerosis, MS. Since then, she's been a force in educating and helping the disabled to lead better lives. She's done it as a motivational speaker, as writing a ongoing column for 20 years now, appearing often on TV, and authoring many articles. Shelley, thanks very much for being here. Was my opening, at least in terms of data, fairly correct? Or was... Yeah, I think that um, you can count disability a lot of ways. But I think, you know, people who have acquired disabilities fall into one category. People with permanent disabilities fall into another. And those who are just feeling the f effects of the aging process. Oh. So, and baby boomers are that large group of mm -hmm. individuals who are turning... 65 at an alarming rate and so we're the biggest population so many of us will be feeling the effects of the aging process. What are some of the ways you can categorize disability due to aging? Well you can't move as fast, you can't process as quickly, you maybe uh, stumble a little, your eyesight isn't as good and your hearing's not as good. Does, does this qualify you for uh, on your car to have a disability a sticker or whatever? Well, I think that's something you have to work out with your physician. Yeah. And if, and especially in Wisconsin, where the snow and ice can be a real detriment to people who have risk of falling or have osteoporosis. Yeah. I should have reminded you before we started, we're talking to people around the world, not just Wisconsin. Okay. Well, then everywhere people live, yeah. they're going to find that, you know, age has its limitations, whether you want to uh, Want to accept them or not, they happen. <laughs> I don't think I do. But um, can, can you break down a little for us when we're talking about disability? What are, what's the most frequent disability? Are we, are we, we're talking about physical disability, are we not? Are right. we talking about but there, medical as well? It, right. It falls into a lot of categories. And not only are there physical disabilities, but there are also emotional or co and cognitive mental health kind of issues. Yeah. There's sensory issues like your hearing and your vision. Yes, sure. And your ability to move around and put it all together. You know, sometimes you might have a, for example, when I go into the water and I'm swimming, I close my eyes often because it's not only the, the feeling of the water, the tactile, the noise of the environment, the lights that are glaring, it is a whole kind of environment where every sense is activated and it's hard to manage all that input mm. and I think part mm -hmm. of it is because of my brain maybe because of MS mm -hmm. but I also think it's because of my age because I mm -hmm. can see similar things happening to my mother who's 91. Wow sure and if we're talking about numbers again I, I kind of like to get things framed but how big is this issue how many people what is the is there a number one leading cause of disability? Probably arthritis. Oh really? Arthritis. And I think they the statistic is 50 million Americans. Well, but not all of those people are quote disabled. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people have arthritis. You take a couple of aspirins and you go about your day. So that 50 million doesn't mean that they're all disabled, but I usually think of it in terms of 20 million are permanently disabled, 20 million are in some stage of temporary, whether it's recovering from an illness or surgery or accident, mm -hmm. and another 10 million feeling the effects of aging. So I think if you have to put that in parameters, like yeah. 2 million have Parkinson's, only 400,000 have MS. Mm -hmm. So okay. those are those are some of the hard numbers, but I think that you know it's kind of a moving. Yeah, it's a moving because I have arthritis in my big toe, but I'm a big athlete and whatever. Yes. Not not 
huge, but I mean, I'm very athletic. Yeah. And uh, so, I, and I don't qualify as disabled. So Correct. it's a continuum. I assume you're talking about when arthritis really yeah, creates it's a, a life impediment in right. some way. Right. Yeah. And, and well, rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. You now you're in a chair. Is, is that what you call that I, machine? I use a wheelchair. Is that a wheelchair you're well, in? Well, it's a scooter. It's a, a scooter. three-wheeled Amigo scooter. I love my little Amigo. Yeah. It's the friendly wheelchair. Uh-huh. And so I, I, that's how I get around. And one of the things I'd like uh, your audience to know is that the word wheelchair bound is really, well, it's, to me, I don't like it. It feels insulting. I am not bound to this chair. This chair is my friend. If I didn't have this chair, I would be stuck. Maybe I would be at now. home. I can't walk. I can't stand up, nor can I bear weight. So once I'm in a place, I can't move to mm -hmm. another place. This scooter takes me around. And so I don't miss much. And we travel, we live a very full life. I'm married for almost 45 years. And that's the other issue with, your, with telling people about disabilities, is we're just like anybody else. We want to enjoy life like everybody else and have the same opportunities. And now we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, at least for the United States, that makes it, uh, requires that buildings, public buildings be accessible, that transportation, that is money, things that are federally funded become accessible. Now this doesn't apply to aging historic buildings unless right. they're tremendously remodeled, a percentage of, then they have to become up to code, so to speak. You know, I wanted to get to that whole political, social issue as we move through this interview. But I, what seems to me the, a very valuable thing where I wanted to hopefully begin with you is what people like me who are able-bodied and don't really think all the time about life from where you're sitting, what we need to know, what, how, how we can be helpful, how we can avoid being dumb boobs and saying things and doing things that are really hurtful. And is, is this worth talking about, Shelley? I think it's extremely important. And one of the most important things to realize is that there, just as in the general population there are negative and positive people, in the, in the world of disability, you're going to find the same thing. Well, what, is there any one thing that is like the most typical faux pas? Yes, talking to the person that I'm with, asking the, the waitress asking my, my luncheon companion, what would she like to order? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness is right. <laughs> it's happened more than once. In fact, I went to a doctor's appointment with my daughter and I was in the wheelchair. My daughter was nine years old. And the receptionist said, who is her appointment with? Oh. Asking my daughter instead of asking me. So basically, talk to us directly. Even if someone is deaf and is there with a interpreter. Don't talk to the interpreter. Talk to the person who you are. So, so they can see the eye contact. The interpreter can hear what you're saying. Yeah, the interpreter will hear and will trans translate it into sign language, but the person deserves the respect of eye contact. That's the other thing. Look at us and say, you know, how can I be helpful? Don't assume that we not want help. Sometimes, you know, people will say, can I get the door for you? Or I just came up in the elevator mm -hmm. and I couldn't reach the buttons. And the gal who was in there with me said, what floor would you like? I mean, it was a normal everyday conversation, not, oh, you poor dear. What, mm. Oh, what, what floor do you want? Um, can I help you find something? You know, sort of a patronizing, you know, diminishing kind of conversation. Years ago, I was, long, many years ago, I was running what was called a community rap center where I was trying to start a place where lay counselors can listen to people's problems. For, and one fellow came to be interviewed who was in a, a chair and he couldn't move um, his arms, but he could move his legs. 
and uh, he moved his chair a little bit. He couldn't get up, but he could, he moved around some with his feet, moving the chair. And I thought, now should my first question be, what's going on with you physically, or should I avoid the subject and not make a big deal about it? I chose to ask him directly. So can you tell me what your disability is? What What's the proper or helpful thing to do there? Ask, but ask in a respectful way. I often want to know why somebody's in a wheelchair or walking with a walker or cane. And I'll say, what's the nature of your disability? Or have you been using a cane a long time? Mm -hmm. What's... You know, but don't you run the risk of someone saying, you think that's all I am is my disability? You look at me and you see a disability. Well, this is the whole thing with the happy campers and the not-so-happy campers. Mm. And they're probably going to take offense at just about anything you say. Mm. Mm. And frankly, the way I look at it is, I, and maybe this is, I, I don't know if it's... Um, a little prideful on my part, but I go out and I feel like I'm an ambassador for people with disabilities. I want them to see that I'm just like anybody else, and I, you know, I do things and I can, if I ask for help, I, you know, I, I'm my own person, and I think sometimes people, especially with acquired disabilities, if you're born with a disability, that's one thing, that's a whole new set. But when you acquire it as you get older, and you know, I was 32 when I was diagnosed. You know, I was a lot different than my friends who were running and going back into the workforce and they had kids and they were carpooled. You know, I was doing none of that. And so I feel like I am somewhat of a representative. And if somebody wants to know, I was a teacher to begin with, mm -hmm. I'm still teaching. My, my classroom is just larger. And so I feel that when I go out that I'm helping people be more comfortable. I've had mm. mothers pull their children aside. The child has said to me, why are you in that? And the mother grabs the arm and said, come on, Bobby, we're leaving. Mm -hmm. You know, wow, like she's, they... she's embarrassed. Ah. And, and I said, no, no, that's okay. I'm really glad you asked me because that's how you learn things. Mm -hmm. And the mother was like you know, the the look in her eye was like a deer in headlights. Wow. Like, so I, I'm, I'm hearing underneath this, relax, be uh -huh. yourself. Yeah. Let your own curiosity express itself. Correct. And if somebody blows you off, or if you go and open a door, I've had people with disabilities tell me, somebody opened the door for me, and, and uh, they were, they kind of pushed me through, you know, and they said, I wanted to open the door myself. And that's another thing I'd like you, like your audience to understand is it will take longer for people with disabilities to do things. If I try and put on my shoes, it'll take me a lot longer than it's going to take somebody else. If I'm struggling to open a door, part of that might be I really want to do it myself. I need the strength to do that. I need the, I, I want to do it. It's a piece of my independence. If you see somebody struggling with the door, it's appropriate to say something like, would you like some help? Or, can I be helpful? Mm -hmm. I'd be As opposed to what? what oh, let me one? get that for you. Oh, you poor dear. I, mm -hmm. oh. Yeah. oh, let me do that for right, so you. So I'm hearing sympathy, not a good idea. Not a good idea. You know, things happen. Mm -hmm. my, vis my disability is vis visual because I come with a scooter. But the people who really have the most difficult time are those who have the hidden disabilities, like. who have hearing loss, yeah. who have pain, who have dizziness, arthritis. Well, how that would we even know that? You we're... probably wouldn't. So nothing you can do because you no don't know. Right, and that's when I say the person who has the problem has to ask for help. Yes. You have to ask for help, and then also wait. If you say, "I can," I, may I help you, or I'd be happy to carry those packages out mm -hmm. to the car for you. Then wait for the person to say yes, and then said, "How can I be helpful?" Mm. Okay. Don't assume 
that you know. Don't go grabbing the things and saying, well, here, I can take this, you right. take that. Ask. Ask. Yeah. So if someone has got groceries, if I see you with a bag of groceries in, in your, uh, what do you call your, your? Scooter. Your scooter. If I said, can I help you put those in your car, that's okay. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Yeah, that's fine. I'd be happy to help you get those in the car. Rather than the sad, oh dear, you poor thing, what happened to you? Yeah. Okay, so we're hearing don't do that. Don't ask with sympathy. But you can ask what's can going ask. on with you. And there's going to be people who are going to blow you off and say, no, I'm doing just fine by myself. Yes. And that's not your fault. They it's ask not. for Exactly. So, so don't feel too bad. Any heroes you see in everyday life? You've, you've been disabled for a long time, Shelley. How 35 many, years. Yeah. And have you had experiences you go, bless you, that's a wonderful thing as you walk through life in terms of how people treat you? I'm not sure I understand that. Would you repeat The question that? is, have you had these moments where strangers treat you well and you think, how lovely? Yes, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. In fact, I'll give you a perfect example that just happened in February. We were on a cruise and I went swimming. They had a chair lift and they lifted me onto the chair. It motorizes, turns, swivels, and drops down into the water. And once I'm in the water, it wasn't over my head. I can kind of swim and walk and be independent because of the buoyancy. And I would do this every day at the same time, and there were other people in the pool with me. And one day, a woman was coming out, and she I was by the steps. She was going up the steps, and she, she said to me, I'm a nurse, and I just applaud you for doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then she leaned over and kissed me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't too much? It, it wasn't too much. It was sort of like, I think in her heart and in her soul, she was so happy for me mm. that I was able to feel like anyone else, to get in the water and to exercise and to be a little independent. I think she just recognized that. You know, I've certainly done podcasts on happiness, and one of the tenets of studies on happiness is whatever setbacks people have they adjust to them within six months and their happiness goes back to that level and I I'm believe that do you does that mm -hmm. fit for you does that fit for disabled people first I would say people with disabilities oh rather okay than thank disabled you. people people with disabilities, disabilities. always put okay. the person you know the people behind or person the person who's blind or the person who has mental health issues. Oh, okay, so if I say the blind person, that's not... Well, you could, but I mean, I, put the person or the I, people okay. first. Kind of getting it now. Yeah. Okay. So that, that the, would... The person. The person. Okay. Yeah. What was I, the question? I forgot the question, too. Oh, we're in trouble. Um, uh, well, I'll ask you a different question then. We were talking about the things that surprise you or the nice surprises, and you're mentioning about this woman. Mm -hmm. um, are there times where you go, I don't believe that person did that. Oh, that is so offensive. I can't really think of anything. Okay. Because I really half the reason I want to do this is to make sure people don't do things yeah. thinking they're doing well um, and in fact mm -mm. they're not. I think including us too is another thing. You know, if you're going, if the if you're at work and the gang is going out for lunch, mm -hmm. you might want to say, if we're going to all go out to lunch, you join us, uh, is the da-da-da restaurant accessible enough for you? To ask that. To ask that question. And sometimes it can be that that place is too noisy. Uh -huh. If you're wearing a hearing aid and, and it's a happening place, you may not want to go there. You may want to go to some place where there's tablecloths and more subdued, you know, carpeting or, you know, wall hanging so that it's not so noisy. And you, because noise and activity, for me, it depletes my energy. With MS, yeah. Yeah, and I think it does for a lot of people, especially older people. You know, it just gets to be too much with not, a, mm -hmm. not enough, not right. light and too much noise. What about in the workplace? Is there different issues in the workplace if you're working side by side with a person who's disabled? 
I think there are. I think sometimes people don't tell, especially those with hidden disabilities, because sometimes it's not the kind of reaction you wanted or, you know, people can say, well, that's nice. I have to do her job now and, you know, and including mine and she's getting paid the same. I mean, there are going to be things like that. I think it's on a case by case basis and depending on where you work. I mean, my husband worked for the state of Wisconsin and he had no problem hiring people with disabilities. And at one time somebody tried to, um, you know, make an issue of not being hired or not being, you know, because he was prejudiced against people with disabilities. Well, you know, it was laughable. I mean, his own wife was disabled. <laughs> so, you know, people have different, people with disabilities can get aggravated and so can the bosses or coworkers. So I think you've got to know where you're working. And if you've got a physical thing that shows with mm -hmm. a wheelchair or walker or cane or something, yeah. you know, you may have to disclose, but you don't have to by law. And, and a, according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, you can ask for reasonable accommodation. I was still working after my diagnosis and I was a teacher who traveled around the city and it became a little difficult for me. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I had different days of the week that I went to two schools that were in close proximity so I wasn't overlapping. You know, I changed the way I worked my schedule mm -hmm. and my boss was involved and the schools were involved and everybody was agreeable. I also, at my lunch hour, instead of eating lunch with the girls, I went to the ladies' lounge and laid down for half an hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to ask for what you need. You can't expect your boss to say, looks like you're having trouble getting in early in the morning. Let me ask this scary question. Sure. Because um, I'm afraid it might make someone angry. but. If you're hiring someone who's disabled, should you think, okay, I'm fortunate that I don't have this disability. I shouldn't expect for every dollar I spend to get a dollar's worth back. I might get 98 cents or 94 cents because they can't, there's some disability that's going to slow them down in some way, some extra expense I'm going to have to go to, but that's my fair share. Or should you expect 100% for your 100%? That's a hard question because it's, I think it's more complicated than, statistics show that people with disabilities are great employees and are, give great value. And they work harder, they're out less often, that they really do give you value. Now, the ADA would say that they have to give you some, if you ask for accommodation, they have to be willing to work with you to try and make that job work. They can't ask you that on an interview, like, is there anything I should know about your physical health? Uh -huh. You know, they can't ask. Okay, well, let's say you come in, we lean yeah. in for an interview, and they say, you know, is, is this going to get in the way of your doing your job? Is that an illegal question to ask? You know, I, I think that's getting, I, I think that the way you phrased it might be over the line. I think you can say how the, the job requires travel. You know, will you be able to handle the travel that's involved? There's, um, you can't say how are you going to do it, mm -hmm. but you'll, it'll require overnight stays in a hotel and traveling on the airplanes. You know, I think they can describe what the job is mm -hmm. and they have a right to know whether or not you can do the things that are in the job description that you're applying for. Other than that, I don't think that I'm an expert enough to say what would be, that's totally over the line or what might be reasons, you know. Well, in the time we have left, I think we've kind of covered the subject of how to be when you're in the presence of a person with a disability. 
But in the broader look at our society, does anything upset you or is there any cause you have where you say, you know what we need to change in America to make America a better place for disabled people? Is anything in terms of accommodations or laws jump out at you? The only thing that jumps out is the, the fact that years ago when I was using a scooter and I was young, there were a lot of things that were not possible for me. I mean, just for example, I would go to this kids' uh, conferences and they were on the second floor of the school. Hmm. And I couldn't get, the teacher would have to come down. Now, all the schools have elevators because they have to be brought up to code. So the issues of me being left out years ago are improving. I expect them to improve even more. I think that the fact that I'm out, I'm not the only scooter in the room. I used to go places where I was the only one. I would go to these huge events where I was speaking or I would go to conventions. I was the only one. I mean, it was ridiculous. How? Why could, do you think that is? Well, because I think things weren't that accessible. The airlines didn't know how to handle people. When you got to a, a, a city, there were no handicapped accessible vans or cars mm -hmm. or buses. Now I can go to get on a bus, on a city bus, and go where I want to go. They also have paratransit for moving people with disabilities so that, for example, I could not stand on a bus stop. If the weather's too cold, if the weather's too hot, I could jeopardize my life. So I have a service where paratransit will come to my house these things didn't exist 35 years ago. The Americans with Disabilities Act was only in 1990. So I think now I go places and all the handicapped parking is taken. It's like, well, good for us. Because people used to say, well, we don't get, those, those handicapped spots are never used. Nobody ever uses them. That's why we piled the snow there. <laughs> What's changed that people are using when they didn't used to use them? I think that people are getting more sensitized and, you know, everybody knows somebody. Mm -hmm. Everybody. Kids, medical science, um, they're saving more children. The returning veterans, um, you know, there are a lot of people that are needing extra accommodation. And, but we're still getting out. We're doing it. And I think the more we're out, and the more people see, the better off we will all be. Because one day, you know, we're the only minority group that anyone can join at any time. Mm -hmm. You know, one last thing. You had a column recently about cruises. You want to help the cruise industry a little and talk about disability and cruises? Oh, my goodness, yes. Give and them a plug. Yes. Oh, thank you. Because we're doing a sailing with Shelley and I'm partnering with Middleton Travel, and we're going to Alaska on an accessible cruise this summer. Okay, but tell me about why cruising is oh, a good fit for people with physical disability. Oh, it's a dream because my husband gets a real vacation. There are, although it sounds like there are a lot of people, and you've heard, you know, norovirus and people getting sick and the cop, you know, mm -hmm. ships turning over and all of that. But you you arrive once, you leave your uh, bags at the dock. The next time you see them, they're in your stateroom. When I walk up into the dining area where they have all of the different food stations, somebody is there to grab, you know, to say, I've got your tray, what, what can we load on it? So somebody accompanies me. My husband can get whatever he wants, sit down and start eating hot food without having to say, all right, here's your food, now I'm going back to get mine. There is wonderful class A entertainment every night. It's accessible. It, everything's accessible. Everything, even the cabins. The one we were on in February, you take you know, the card key that mm -hmm. is like a credit card, you drop it into the slot where you would normally open a door, and the door automatically wow. opens. Does the, do the cruise companies want to know before you get on board yes. if you are? Yes, and because those cabins are 
quite a bit bigger than regular cabins, mm -hmm. you have to prove or you have to, mm -hmm. you know, a, yeah. a, a, provide some documentation that you do need a handicapped accessible room. And, and the cruise that you're promoting, which I, I don't know, yeah, will be very successful at helping you, but I'm curious, are you, are you promoting it particularly to the disabled? Well, it's a regular cruise. It's on Celebrity, which is the one we always go yeah. on. And they have, uh, we've got accessible cabins reserved. Okay. And it's, you know, first come, first serve, but they also have regular cabins. And there'll be, you know, upwards of 2,000 passengers. Okay. Well, well, great. Any parting thoughts or ideas or resources you'd like to share? I think if I were leaving with, with one more message, it's that if you've got a friend who's sick, recovering, has now a disability, whose husband's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, whatever, don't just say, call me if you need anything. Call them and say, I'm running to the grocery store. Do you need anything? I've got, I have to stop at the library, the pharmacy. Give them an idea of what you might need. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And if you've got an open morning, say, look, I've got an open morning. Do you want to go run some errands? My girlfriend just did this with a friend of hers. She said, I was just too tired. So I stayed in the car and she ran in and out of the store getting the things I needed. They both had companionship. My friend got out, and it was a good situation. So offer help. Offer what you think you would need in that situation. Finally, would you like to tell us where people could find some of your writings on the net or whatever? And Well, I've also written seven books. Oh my so goodness. my books are available on Amazon, but they're also on my website. My website is makinglifeeasier.com. And my email address is Shelley, S-H-E-L-L-E-Y, at makinglifeeasier.com. And the people you're addressing are people with disabilities, and I'm like... I also, the things I do professionally and uh, personally is I talk to people about getting on with their life after it's fallen apart. So I'm very solution-oriented, whether it's finding a way to help you get your socks on or telling your friends that you can no longer participate in tennis because you've just been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Well, Shelley, I'd like to thank you for sharing this uh, experience and knowledge and perhaps inspiration. And I hope you'll join us on the next edition of Insights. And remember, you can find all our podcasts at dickgoldbergradio.com or search for Dick Goldberg at iTunes or YouTube.